In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Thank you for joining us again. Today we're going to continue our study of the book of uh, the first epistle of St. Peter. And last time we did a brief introduction and we covered verses 1 through 12. And today we're going to start off with verse 13. And so we start with verse 13 that says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest in your hope, uh, fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so um, just to put in context, uh, St. Peter is reminding his hearers of the greatness of the salvation that's waiting for them. And so he urges them to live consistently with their status as those that are redeemed of God. And so when he says, therefore, in verse 13, it's it's the therefore points to the verses three through 12 of that promise, right? Of being consistent um, to living consistently with the status of the redeemed of God. And that was the basic summarization of verses three through 12. It's that prayer of thanksgiving. And so he's saying based on that, that's the therefore. Therefore, because of that stuff in verse, uh, verses three to 12, therefore gird up the loins of your mind. And so he urges uh, the people, the readers, to uh, gird up the loins of their minds. The image of, of girding up, it really points to what the clothing of the day, right? People wore long, uh, loose flowing robes. Um, before they could do any of the work, they would gather the robe together. They would tuck it into their belt so that they wouldn't trip. And so when St. Peter is urging his hearers to gird up the loins of their minds, in other words, St. Peter is urging them to prepare their minds for action. Um, the, the word, the world will, will challenge them and they have to prepare themselves to meet the challenge by being sober, right? To be clear-minded um, and by hoping perfectly on the grace being brought uh, to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, the word sober in the Greek um, doesn't refer just to physical sobriety, right? That is, um, you know, being absent of drunkenness. But it also points to self-control and maintaining an inner vigilance and balance. And so the world can um, provoke a sense of excitement and agitation, even panic. And the Christian, St. Peter is saying, is to keep their mind sober, to keep level-headed. And so as well as keeping this inner composure, the Christian meets the world's challenges by, by hoping perfectly on the grace being brought to him by Christ at the second coming. And so that is, the Christian fixes his hope completely on the favor and glory that Christ will bestow on them when he comes. And so when, when, when the world tempts him to sin, um, the Christian is strengthened to resist this as he thinks of the reward of his enduring and his perseverance uh, that will gain him. And then to verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And so in baptism, um, they were called to be God's obedient children as they become his sons. And so they must live out their baptism and not be conformed to their old ways, um, which were, uh, it was ignorance, right? As pagans, um, when they did not know who the living God was. And so the desires of lust and greed, um, they, they can't be indulged with anymore. The world uh, would like to squeeze them into, into this uh, shaping, into this mold, uh, forcing them to live as they used to live before they knew God and his and his demands and his kind of standard um, this they may they must not consent to instead uh, like the holy one of Israel who called them into baptism they must be holy they must become holy themselves in all of their daily conduct and that's why it's written you shall be holy as, for I am myself is holy so Saint Peter is is referencing Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44. Again, this is a theme of, of St. Peter. He, he calls uh, a lot of the Old Testament, um, that this is a type of his, of his style of writing. And so when God called them in baptism to become his children, he called them to share his holiness so that as children, they resemble their father. Um, and they can understand 
the necessity for this themselves when they remember their their um, their post uh, baptismal worship. In that worship, they invoke and call upon God as Father, right? Like when they say "Our Father," and yet He is the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. And they invite, uh, if they invite into their midst such an impartial judge, uh, they have to be careful and conduct themselves in fear during this time, um, their time on earth, uh, because he won't show favoritism to them. Uh, if, they, if they sin a, 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 a big sin, uh, he will judge them and condemn them, um, both in this age and in the last. And so St. Peter is urging them, therefore, um, be careful not to sin and be holy in their daily conduct. Um, St. Augustine says something nice. He says, we have earthly parents who beget us on earth for struggle, uh, for struggle than death. However, we have other parents for God is our father and the church is our mother who begets us for eternal life. Let us reflect on whose children we are and let us behave accordingly in a manner fit for such a father. For we have found we found a father in heaven. Therefore, we have to be careful in our behavior on earth. Whoever is related to such a father as ours has to behave in a way befitting uh, to deserve that relation and to obtain that inheritance. In verses 17, 18, and 19. And if you call on the father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you uh, were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold for your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as the lamb, as, a, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so um, there is a more compelling reason why they should avoid sin and then fear of judgment, right? That they're not redeemed by corruptible things like silver or gold from the, you know, uh, useless conduct delivered from their forefathers. No, they, they were once enslaved to idols and bound by fear of death, walking every day in the useless and en empty conduct of their way of, of life, which was delivered to them by tradition from their pagan ancestors. All of their uh, rituals only led to death. The true God has redeemed them and brought them back from this slavery. But the price of this ransom was not silver or gold, the usual way slaves were, were brought back. No, rather they were ransomed with precious blood as of a blameless and spotless lamb, right? Which is the blood of Christ. Christ shed his blood to buy them back for God and to bring them to life. And so gratitude for the sacrifice is an even more potent incentive to righteousness rather than the fear of judgment. And so Christ, who is the blameless and spotless lamb, offered his life for them. And so how can they live in such a way as to nullify that holy sacrifice? St. Ambrose said, Therefore, the cross of the Lord is my wisdom. The death of the Lord is my salvation. For we are saved with his precious blood, as St. Peter said. Let no one think that a different price was paid for them because of his richness. And then verse 20 and 21. For indeed, he was foreordained. Uh, he indeed was foreordained because uh, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and, and hope are in God. You know, the world uh, may think that Jesus and his movement are just another part of the rise and fall of history, and that the Christian movement will fade like any other historical movements of the time. But it is the other case, right? For Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world. And that is, you know, God knew before the world began that he would, what, what he would do with Christ, through Christ. And, and Jesus' work was part of that plan um, that God had from the beginning and was manifested now in the last times. So the Christian movement is it, it, not going to fade like other movements resembling it. It is through this movement that St. Peter's Gentile hearers and believers in God, 
right? It, right? That is the, in God who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory, right? Before Jesus appeared, the Gentiles remained separated from the Jews. They, they were lost in their, in their pagan ways of life. And, and now even the Gentiles are brought to the true God and the old ways of the world are breaking down as God through Christ uh, has created a new humanity. And so through Christ, uh, their faith and hope are now in the true God. In verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. And so since they have been so redeemed and have in obedience to the truth of the gospel purified their souls in baptism um, with a brotherly love, let them fulfill this baptismal obedience with a fervent love for one another from the heart. So the community um, is, the, is the purpose of their um, union with Christ. They have purified their whole lives, right, for the purpose of mutual love in Christ. So P St. Peter here thinks, you know, primarily of love between the Christians in community rather than uh, love for outsiders, though, of course, this is good too. And so his main focus is love for the brotherhood, right? Um, and the <clears throat> preservation of, of Christian unity. And so above all else, the unity of the, of the believers are, are so important. In verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And so this love and this unity are important because their baptism made them all brothers and sisters, united by the indestructible bonds of, of brotherhood, right? They have been regenerated in baptism, not from corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the living and the remaining um, word of God. Men received natural birth from seed, which is corruptible and mortal, and, and a natural life on earth will eventually end. And so the seed which gives new birth is incorruptible and it begins a life that will never end. Uh, for the seed is the word of God and the gospel that is living and eternal and it remains and abides forever. And this ties, the ties of kinship that unite the Christians surpass anything on earth. And verse 24, um, because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and its flower falls away. But the word of the, of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word um, which by the gospel was preached to you. That as we conclude chapter one, um, this is what Isaiah uh, chapter 40 verses six through eight means when it says all flesh is grass and the, and its glory as the flower of grass the grass was dried up and the flower falls off but the word of the lord remains to the ages um, all flesh all life in this age with all its uh, flowerly uh, um, excitement is as um, temporary as the grass of the field for you know, all of its apparent beauty and glory, soon it's dried up and, and the glory falls off. Beauty fades and, and the strength fails and all men die. But the word of the Lord remains to the ages and the life it gives never dies. And so St. Peter adds that this word of the Lord spoken of by Isaiah is the very word of the gospel, which was preached as good news to them. And they must love one another for that gospel um, gave a, a birth and a command of kinship, of unity that is eternal and makes them different from this world. And so we go into chapter two, which is basically can be summarized as what are then our responsibilities as children of God? Um, in verse, verse one, it says, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and all, and all evil speaking. So because they have been regenerated in baptism, 
for the purpose of forming this loving community, they therefore must put off all that remains of the old ways that would harm that community, even as they put off their clothes in preparation for baptism. They must now put aside sin against love. And so in particular, they must have done away with all wickedness, all malice, um, the ill will that poisons fellowship. They must renounce all guile, all manipulation, all words springing from ulterior motives. Um, they also have to shun hypocrisies, uh, acts of insincerity, uh, where you know it, it diminishes a, a loving attitude um, and and like spitefully uh, acting behind someone's back. They they have to done be done with envy, right? The acts of jealousy, um, where we try to be better than our neighbor. Um, and last on the list of, of the vices is all evil speakings, right? Which include acts of slander and criticism and, you know, misrepresentation. It, it is all um, so easy to hide in such sins and in high sounding names to let them survive in our Christian life. Um, we make a lot of excuses to fall into these sins, but these things destroy the, the unity um, which is the goal of baptism. And we have to be very careful of that even today. As newborn babes uh, desire the pure milk of the word um, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Um, St. Clement of Alexandria says, um, it, the church, is the milk of love. Blessed is he who nurses from it. It is available in winter as well as in the summer. It does not need to be heated or cooled. It is always ready. And so having renounced these sins, as in verse one, we turn to the positive. Um, and as newborn infants, fresh from the baptismal womb and the new life in Christ, they should long for the milk which the mother church provides. Just as babies are um, crying for the milk as the only way they can grow and thrive, so should St. Peter's hears, right? Um, they should have this uh, seeking of the true milk as the only way they may grow for salvation and reach the kingdom. And St. Peter adds, you know, if they have tasted that the Lord is kind, how, how good is that milk? Assuming that they have truly experienced for themselves how sweet the ways of holiness are, St. Peter says, um, of course, they're going to want more. It is it is the honest spiritual teachings that transmit from generation to generation. It doesn't contain any philosophy or elaboration, but rather it's the spirit and life of the church, which the saints have experienced and has been passed down through the ages. It is the rituals. It is the tradition of the church, which revive the soul and help the flesh and spirit in worship. It is the intercessions and prayers of the saints. And so the milk that enables them to grow is described as, um, as rational. And the word for, for this in Greek comes from um, the word in verse one, uh, which comes from the word guile. Anyways, it describes milk that is pure and undiluted um, and not watered down as some of the milk was. The thought is of Christian teachings that is pure and free from any kind of secular influence um, because these kind of teachings would deceive the heart. And so the milk or the teachings is also described as, as rational. And the Greek word um, uh, is, comes from the words uh, like uh, reason and rationality. And here it describes milk that is uh, non-material or spiritual, that which is given by uh, the word of God. The logos. Um, this is what the believers are to seek after: the teachings that are pure and spiritual, and coming from the apostolic tradition, and free from the the worldly mixture, right? And so, coming to Him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so in verses 4 and 5, the teaching is available at the assemblies of the church. 
they have to come to, to Christ there. He is the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen and honored in the sight of God. And St. Peter here alludes to Psalm 118, um, and he also alludes to Isaiah 28, 16. Um, Christ, in Mark chapter 12, uh, verse 10, applies to himself as the image of the stone, right, rejected by men, and the world as worthless and a stone no good for the building, but which God chose to be the honored cornerstone on which the whole building depends. Um, the, the world rejects Christ as a deluded deceiver, and they can't understand how a crucified carpenter can be the power of God. And in the same way, the world rejects the Christians as deluded, and they can't understand how they live and die for such a man. Um, but as Christ is the living stone, right, because he is the source of eternal life, and so the believers are living stones because they receive that life from him, and they are to come to him week by week uh, for the Eucharist to receive the teachings of new life. As they do that, they are being, being uh, built up by God as a spiritual house, a temple for the a holy priesthood, and a dwelling place for God himself. And the weekly gatherings of the Christians is not, you know, as the pagans think, a place where um, you know, misfits or, or troublemakers assemble. No, it's a place where God himself manifests and dwelling in the Christians by his spirit. And so he references the holy priesthood. And so St. Peter um, combines this metaphor with his previous one. The Christians gathered are not only God's temple, they are a holy priesthood that ministers in the temple. And their weekly Eucharists, they offer spiritual sacrifices that are well accepted by God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the sacrifices of other men are the, the bodies and blood of animals. But the sacrifices of Christians are spiritual, consisting of praise and thanksgiving and a memorial to the cross and the resurrection of Christ. And so, what are these acceptable spiritual sacrifices to God? It's slaying the, the will or the ego. It's, it's the best sacrifice um, that one can raise his hand to the cross and, and, like, and, and slay his personal will and his private desires. Uh, kind of like Abraham was ready to take the knife and to slaughter Isaac you know, as Isaac, the son of blessing and promise, returned to life, we too should slaughter our will by the cross so that we have uh, the strong will of Christ, his desire and his mind. Um, and so we sing with um, St. Paul saying, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I have crucified the ego so that Christ may live in me. Um, the sacrifice of humility uh, in front of God and men, um, Saint, uh, 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 the sacrifice of good deeds. Um, so doing good and righteous work involve a sacrifice and carrying the cross. And the Lord smells these as, as acceptable sacrifices through his cross. The sacrifice of pain and suffering, the sacrifice of the flesh. Um, the believer, the Christian, doesn't look at his body as an enemy but he, he takes care of his body. But what, when the Bible or the Holy Father speak about um, a fight against the flesh, they mean the desires of the flesh. Um, and so we, we need to control um, the, the desires of the flesh. Uh, and we have to, we have to um, not present the body as instruments of unrighteousness, to sin, but we present our body as instruments to the righteousness of God. And so all the desires and emotions and feelings of the members of the body um, are sanctified to become energy helping the spirit instead of a force fighting the spirit. Um, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, um, St. Paul says, and he commands us saying, therefore by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And so the sacrifice of thanksgiving is the sacrifice of the angels, the heavenly creatures that have no physical bodies, 
but they offer uh, to offer as living sacrifices and they don't have any material belongings uh, to offer to charity um, right they have no one that can bother them so they can forgive they have no um, contradicting will to god um, they don't have physical pain the only thing they can offer is as praise and thanksgiving and so the, the church therefore um, trains their children to live a life of praise as in the praises of the psalmody or the psalms or the hymns they are trained to do the work of the angels saint anthony I'll, and i'll end here for today um, saint anthony the great the father of the monks he elaborates on this on this idea when he says when you go to sleep on your bed remember god's blessings and his care for you and thank him for that then when you are filled with these memories you will rejoice in the spirit of offering praises to him in the highest when one is not committing evil the only thing that can satisfy god is the offering of thanksgiving and so we'll end here from today and we'll continue on for next week thank you and glory be to god forever amen